When we want to save a file, we have to save it somewhere. As we said just a few moments ago, it has to be stored on some type of hardware. So let's take a few minutes to talk about storage and media. Remember that storage is not the same as memory. Memory is volatile and storage is something that we call persistent. Storage can be something that is known as fixed or removable. Fixed is inside the CPU. For example, a hard drive is an example of a fixed drive because we can't take it out and move it. It's kind of like a library book that has to be used at the library because it can't be checked out. The other type that we have is known as removable media. And I think by the name you can understand that that's something that we can remove from either ports or drives on the computer and we can take it with us. A floppy disk, a CD or DVD, a USB thumb drive or an external hard drive are examples of removable media. Now some of you may be saying, well wait a second, I can't take the CD drive out of my CPU. No, you can't take the drive out, but you can take the media, in other words the CD itself. That's what makes it removable. These days, we also have some that are all-inclusive, for example, an external hard drive. That's a piece of hardware, and it in itself is removable. We don't take media out of it. It is both the hardware and the media all in one. Now, I know sometimes when you're talking to people or you're reading things, it gets kind of confusing about all of these giga, mega, tera things that we hear about, what's a bit and what's a byte. We're not going to get into all of the details because that's a fairly technical discussion. But just remember that computers measure things using the One that you will hear an awful lot of is something called a byte. A byte is simply a unit of storage on a computer. A byte in itself is really too small. So usually we see it with some kind of metric prefix associated with it. Kilobytes these days are usually the smallest unit that we see. In short, a byte is the amount of storage it takes to hold one character. In other words, the letter A takes up a byte. See, I told you that's probably way too detailed for what you want to know. But let's talk about some of the prefixes. I believe when I was a kid, there was this push that the United States was going to go to the metric system. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly how old I am, but I think I was in about second grade, and now I'm far beyond second grade, and I don't think that has happened. But still, in a lot of scientific and technology arenas, we use the metric prefixes. So just as a review of something you probably haven't heard since you were in school, a kilo, or a lowercase k, means a thousand. Mega, with a capital M, is a million. Giga, with a capital G, is a billion, with a B. And tera, which you will start hearing more and more of, is one trillion. So these are the prefixes that we can put in front of bytes. We can have kilobytes, kb, megabytes, mb, gigabytes, gb, and terabytes, TB. Often you will have files, for example, a small word processing document that could be in kilobytes, maybe 64 KB. If you're working with any kind of pictures, audio, or video, they're probably going to be in megabytes. Your hard drive, however, is probably now measured in gigabytes. For example, I have a 250 gigabyte hard drive. And we're already beginning to see some hard drives and some external devices that measure things in terabytes, which is a lot of space. So again, you don't need to remember about exactly how to calculate the math involved with this. Just know the range that they work in. Kilo, mega, giga, tera, and that each one is bigger than the other significantly. With this information, you'll now be able to save your files to the appropriate location with good names and also know about how much space you have on your media, such as your hard drive. I am not at all worried about having enough hard drive space in order to save the little text file I'm about to create as a demo. But I do want to show you where you can find your file size. So for just a second, I'm going to move on my desktop over to the My Computer System icon, and I'm going to give that a double click. That opens it up and shows me all of the drives that are available on this computer. We're not going to worry too much about all the details here, but I just want you to take a look at my C drive, which is the hard drive sitting in my CPU. It has this nice little kind of bar that shows me that I currently have a 31.9 gigabyte hard drive, and I currently have 20.3 gigabytes that are free. And if I look at the little bar, I can see that I haven't even come close to half, maybe closer uh, between a quarter and a third of my hard drive is full. So that's good news. This is a fast way to always check and see how big your hard drive is, as well as how much space is available. And you can do that really with any of the drives that are available in your computer. 
For now though, let's just go ahead and close this window out. And let's get on to creating a simple little text file so we can go through the save process. I'm going to go to my Start button, and I'm going to select WordPad, or if you prefer, you can type WordPad, and we'll get that launched. Now, just because I can, I'm going to go ahead and maximize this. WordPad is a simple word processor, and this isn't a typing class, but I do need to type something that I can then save as a file. So I'm going to get very creative with you here, and I'm going to type, this is a file I can save. Now I know, not very exciting, but that's really not the purpose of what we're doing. We simply want to save the file. So what do I need to do now? If I was to actually click on the close button or to use the file menu to exit out of the application, you should always be assured that in any application that I know of, if you have not saved the file or if you have made changes to the file since it was last saved, you will always be prompted. In other words, a computer application will not allow you to simply close something without giving you the opportunity to save it. That should make you feel a little bit at ease. If I were to click on the red X to close the window, it would come up and say, do you want to save your file? And I could say yes. But we want to go through more of a formal process. So instead, I'm going to move over to the left side of my screen, and I'm going to click the little down button to the left of the Home tab, which is the equivalent of my file menu. One of the options here is Save, but I also want you to see that another option is Save As. When you have two options, the question often is, well, what's the difference between the two? The very first time you save a file, you really don't have an option. Whether you click Save or Save As, it's always going to bring up the Save As dialog box. That's because the first time you save a file, you have to tell the computer all three of those pieces of information we talked about. What location do you want it saved to? What is the file name going to be? And what is the file type, or the last name, or the file extension that you want? So, since this is a new file, regardless of which one I chose, it actually is going to go to the Save As command. Now, after you have saved a file, then these two things do different things. Once it's been saved the first time, if I then just click Save, I'm not prompted for anything. Save will automatically save it to the same location with the same name as the same file type as when it was last saved. That's probably going to be what you'll do most often as you open up and edit documents. I can also, however, use the Save As command after I've saved it the first time. If I want to save it to a different location, or if I want to give it a different name, or if I want to save it as a different type of file, all three of those or any combination will be available using the Save As command after a file has been initially saved. Well, just to prove my point, we haven't saved this one yet, so I'm going to click the Save option and show you that the Save As dialog box is what comes up. In a later chapter, we'll talk about folders and folder structure and those types of things. But for now, know that every application is going to come up in what's known as a default directory or a default folder. For Windows 7, it happens to be something called Libraries. And in Libraries, there is a special place just for documents, as opposed to music, pictures, and videos. On older operating systems, for example on Windows Vista, it will probably just open to Documents, which are the documents for the current user. And on Windows XP, it probably goes to My Documents. That default location can be changed, but that's something that you learn in each specific application, because each application does it a little bit differently. What we're going to do is we're simply going to stay in this default location, which is in the Documents folder inside of our libraries. The next step will be, now that I've chosen the location, is to give it a file name. And you'll see that by default, this window opens up with Document already highlighted. Now trust me, you do not want to save your documents with names like Document 1, Document 2, Document 3. That doesn't mean anything. So this is where our naming conventions come in. I'm going to give this, again, a very unique name. I'm going to call it Sample Saved Document. And then I'm going to put a question mark after it. 
Now the reason I'm putting the question mark after it is because the question mark is one of those forbidden symbols. I told you you can't actually use a question mark as part of a file name. And I just wanted to kind of show you that that's true. Before I do that though, I want to talk a little bit about the file type. We can see that in WordPad, the default format or the default file type is known as rich text format or RTF. RTF is the three letter extension. But I also have a drop down. If I click on the drop down arrow, I can see that I do have options. I can save this as an Office Open XML document, Open Document Text, a plain text document, a text document in MS DOS format, or a Unicode text document. Here's a little hint for you if you don't know what these different things are, then you probably shouldn't be saving to them. And most often, you're probably going to want to just keep the default. For our purposes, I am going to keep it as just an RTF file. So I can either click on that, or I could have also just pressed Escape to get out of it. I did want to show you, though, that if you choose a different format that is not the default, for example, a text document, some of your applications will give you the option in the Save As dialog box to say, you know what, I want this to always be the default format anytime I create a document in this particular application. In other words, I can change the default for WordPad documents to always save as a plain text document. That's not what I want to do, so I'm going to go ahead and move it back. Now I'm going to click on the Save button, and I want you to watch what happens. Well, first of all, if I click on Save, nothing happens. Now the reason is, in this particular application, as soon as I change the file type, it erased the name. So just as a best practice, I always recommend that when you're saving under different file types that you set the file type first and then type your name. Not all applications will do this, but it's the best habit and then it always works. So I'm going to go ahead and type again, and this time I'll call it Sample Saved Document. With my question mark. And once again, I'm going to try to click on the Save button. This time you notice that the box is still open and it highlighted my file name. WordPad is a fairly basic or simple application, so it doesn't give me much feedback. But what it's telling me is it doesn't like the file name. We know that that's because I have that question mark in there and that's not allowed. Many other applications will actually come up with a little message window that says you have used an inappropriate character. It'll tell you exactly what it doesn't like. I'm going to press my backspace key to get rid of the question mark. Now I'll click Save. And guess what? Now the dialog box closes and I can see that it has been saved. I know because if I look up at the title bar at the very top of my screen, it no longer says document, it says sample save document. This is perfect. Remember I promised you if you make a change that you'll be prompted before you close the file. So now I will make a change. And let's pretend that I forgot to save the file. Now I can go back up to the upper right hand corner of my screen, click on the red X, and WordPad is nice enough to say, oh, wait a second, you've made changes. Do you want to save your changes? And here we can actually see the full path. Sample save document dot RTF, there's our last name. And in this case, I can say, yes, please do save the changes. That closes the file and the application and takes me back to the desktop. Now remember, if I would have done file save as after I saved it the first time, the same dialog box would have opened giving me the opportunity to change the location or the name or the file type. If I would have simply clicked Save, I wouldn't have seen anything happen, but I can be assured that the file has been saved with the latest greatest version.